Maybe it was long. <laughs> okay. So, Lighthouse Sunday School, understanding Hindus and Sikhs, um, especially uh, if it's with the Sikhs, they believe there is only one God, unlike, uh, unlike Hindus, but there's no trinity. And so, please read the information about that. Um, with the Hindus, you will find there are many, 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 many gods. And so, if they really practice Hinduism, if they come to Lighthouse, and they have this a strong Hindu background. When you're in the class and you're talking about Jesus, no problem accepting Jesus. Oh, he is like an avatar, you know, like the movie Avatar. Um, so when you're dealing with them, then you have to talk about that Jesus was a historical person. He was real. And then you would also have to focus on it's not just many, many gods. There's one, there's only one true God. And so those are things that you'll have to consider as well when you're, when you're, dealing, when you're dealing with Hindus. So you'll have to really pray about it, read the material. Uh, we couldn't find any specific material for children, but in general this is for, for Hindus and for Sikhs. So if you're dealing with them, then you want, to, uh, you, want to read, you want to read this as well. Okay? Okay, I just wanted to say just a couple of things before I turn it over to the experts. What I want to say is this. When we look at teaching children in Sunday school, I just want to remind you of what Jesus did and what he said and how he treated children. Jesus said, let the children come to me. Don't keep them from coming to me. And Jesus loved and honored and respected children, not for who they would be one day, not for, okay, they've got a lot of potential, although they will be somebody special one day, although they do have potential for the future, some, something that they will be and God has a plan for them. Jesus loved them as they were as children. And so that's what we do as well. As children, as they were. And he dealt with them as children. Not just, well, one day you will be worthy. One day you will be a, val a valuable member of society. They were valuable to Jesus and he showed it even as they were children. And so as we come this afternoon to, to dealing with and handling this precious, precious resource uh, should say resource, these precious gifts um, that we have, we want to do the best we can. Some of us are natural teachers, but because talking about Jesus and teaching about Jesus is a spiritual work, our natural gifts are not enough. Some of us are not very good teachers at all, perhaps, but we like to learn. And the, the good thing about that is that we can learn, and that as we pray, God, the Holy Spirit, will help us touch their lives and change their lives now. Um, and so we thank you for your investment, for your willingness to serve, and I'm going to turn it over to the three wise women. <laughs> Not the three wise men, but the three wise women. So the first wise woman is Glenda. Is Glenda the first wise woman? Oh, okay, here we go. Miss Glenda, we turn it over to you. watching eyes watching eyes watching I would be expecting you to show me eyes watching can you show me eyes watching eyes watching show me show me show me eyes watching just watch that's all she's asking eyes watching he is listening Uh, sorry, I'm listening, but I would like to listen a little bit louder <laughs> because I'm, 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 I'm recording. Next one is very appropriate. <laughs> Voice quiet. <laughs> Voice quiet. Don't be afraid to wait for that either. Voice quiet. And finally, body still. Body still. You should not have anything in your hands. Don't be still. Nothing in your hands. Never be afraid to wait. Don't be afraid to wait. Because if you've given an instruction, eyes watching, ears listening, and somebody's still talking, then you, are, you haven't got their attention. Don't be afraid to wait. 
uh, we used to use a system at school which was uh, clapping, and, and very often people, you know, and the kids are, and the kids are going, oh, you know, what's not going on? So they're clapping, but they're still talking, and then you don't have their attention. So as a school, we've decided on a program, it's actually called Second Steps, and we all have different preferences within the school, but we've decided this is the one we're going to use. We're all going to use this one. And so now we've been doing it since August. At first we would actually take these sheets down to the playground. So as you're saying it, eyes watching. You don't need to do that now. You go to the playground and you say to the kids, eyes watching, and you get kids sitting down and they're already body still. So they start to respond. Um, you're teaching uh, on, on kind of rotation. But the thing that needs to be consistent in your class is you need to use the same method. Because here when I did that, you're looking at me, you're thinking, what does she want? What's she expecting? Does she want me to eyes watching? What's happening here? And that happens with you when you go into a classroom. It's If it's the first time, or oh, is this the one that wants me to clap hands or watch? If you're all using the same system, the kids will be into it, and it becomes routine. Because if they don't have their eyes on you, if they're not listening, if their voice isn't quiet and their body is still, you're not teaching them anything. It's just going to go over their heads. So you don't have to use this method. You can use a different method, but what I would say is you need to agree on a method that works. Now, some of you may already be using a method that really works well. Keep that going, but just extend it so that everybody's using that method. Um, it is helpful to have a visual prompt. So whatever it is you're doing, if it's a clap hands, have a picture of clap hands. It might even be you clapping your hands. So that these pictures can be up in the room, that you can refer to it, eyes watching, ears listening, whatever it is. You can refer to it. Some of our teachers actually have smaller versions of these, and they wear them on a lanyard around their neck. And if somebody's not watching while they're busy talking, they'll be going like this, so that somebody knows, oops, yes, I'm not, I'm not listening. Um, but it's helpful to have visuals because some kids work really well with the visual prompt. But, but my main thing is, in terms of attention, if you don't have their attention and you're not prepared to wait for it, then you're not really going to be able to teach them anything. So for example, if you say, okay, when everyone's quiet, we're going to be playing this song, ready with the tape. And everyone's not quiet, but you just go ahead and press the tape anyway. You haven't got their attention. The fact that you're prepared to stand and wait, somebody's going to notice, hey, what's going on? She's just standing waiting. She stopped doing the talking, and she's just waiting. Then when everybody's still, then you press the tape. Don't be afraid to wait. It's OK. And the waiting time will get shorter. But uh, my main advice is be consistent. Um, not just you yourself personally, but as a group, be consistent. Now. I've got some uh, tips and advice they've got, but I think Corinne will join. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, listening. Body still, Barbara, to take over. the microphone, because I'm recording <laughs> this, and That's people who will be right. watching it online, they will not hear anything. <laughs> that was really good, Steglenda. Yeah. What side do you want to have the microphone? <laughs> that side or on that side? Okay, maybe Glenda also needs us to have it on that side. <laughs> but I was trying to, you know, listening, but she did not listen to me. <laughs> She's not used to your sign. Yeah, she didn't know my sign. <laughs> that there are so many teachers or I think there are more teachers than children in the church <laughs> and that's that's great because eventually many of you you will go home and you will have the training and anyway uh, Sunday school time is very short every week it's one hour at the most. Uh, it's a very important time. Um, ma make it worthwhile. Like what um, Glenda said, 
Make sure they listen to you. It's a sacred time. This is something that the children will need to repeat to them. They are not just there to talk and do whatever they want. I am very sad to realize that myself, I've even thought like this, oh, this is Sunday school, this is not real school, so we must not be too hard on them, but no, that is wrong, that is a wrong thinking. Uh, this is, you can have fun, but they make the most of that time. So they, they must have some, some manners, some discipline and listening. It's not less important their, their, than their school when they go to school every day. They are there five days a week, one hour here, and they would do whatever they want. No, this is not acceptable. Um, you must make sure, like Linda said, when you're teaching, they must listen, they must hear. If people are talking and disturbing, there are others who really want to listen, but they can't, they are disturbed by others. Respect in the, is needle, needed, sorry. And so it, it, I think it's important that we establish a kind of um, way of discipline. But this said, preventing problems is better than solving them. And if you want to prevent, there is one thing that is very important is you need to make it interesting. You need to make the children like to come in your class. Make it fun, make it interesting, be a good storyteller, have some activities, be prepared. Don't make it boring and reading your notes, but you know, learn your story. And even if you forget some details, just, just go for it. You know, read it a lot at home. So when you come to teach them, you don't necessarily need your notes and you can have expression. Make it interesting so that when you start applying discipline, if they are prevented to participate, they will not be very happy. Discipline has to hurt a little bit so that they will learn to control themselves. Not you punishing, but themselves making choices. So for this, I will bring very quickly, I have a pile of documents and I will try to, to uh, summarize these and we can talk about it later as groups. Do you want anything now? Not, not these one now. But I will summarize. As I said, when the children come and they see you there, they need to really be, oh, this is her, I'm so happy it's her, and then the other one, and that they must like you all. Not because you're so kind and you let go and you're lenient, let them be foolish, no. But because you really love them, you want their good, you want their best, you do what you do the best for their good. But I did I, I, I was following a little course, I'm not quite finished almost. It's called classroom management. And to me when I listened to when I watched it, it's online. I said, Oh my goodness, I should have <laughs> I should have had these kinds of lessons when I was a Sunday school teacher because I've made so many mistakes by thinking, ah, oh, this, this is Sunday school, we should not be so, you know, tough on them. It's, a, it's But no. So, what I have learned, and here I will tell you, you can go online, I don't know if you have any paper to take notes. I took some lot of uh, information from um, a website called smartclassroommanagement.com. If you want to write it down, they have infinite articles 
Of course, it's for a normal class. It's in school, day-to-day -day, um, classroom management. But you've got very good, very good uh, principles. So what they suggest, and in my other course that I did is the same, is you need to establish some rules. What is acceptable and not acceptable in your classroom and make it make it short not too many here it says a classroom management plan has two and only two purposes to state the rules of the classroom and to state exactly what will happen if these rules are broken maybe i sound harsh but I think children need it, but as I speak, you will understand more what, where, where I'm going. So here, what the, the, the teacher was mentioning, he only um, gives four rules, but you know what's going on in your classroom, in the little ones, and the bigger ones, and the high school, I don't know. You need to adapt it. It can be listen and follow instruction. Raise your hands before speaking. So it's even speaking to the person next to you. I don't have a pencil. Can I ask my, my friend to have? You know, it's very simple. Put your hand up before speaking or before leaving your seat. Keep your hands and feet to yourself. Last week I was, uh, not last week, but I was helping uh, Cherry and Choco with the children in their house. And there were two little girls across the table. They were just kicking each other for fun, but they were disturbing each other. Keep your feet and your hands to yourself and respect your classmate and your teacher. That's what he suggests. You can make your own. Just think of what is needed. What are the difficulties you encounter in your classroom? And make it very simple and general. It can be like, make good choices. It's vast. You know, hitting someone is a, is a wrong choice, it's a bad choice. Being kind is a good choice. So you can, you can make it uh, the way you want, but make some rules. And, he, and then after you have made a plan for some rules, you can make a plan for some consequences. And most of the place, uh, the advice I've read about it, already uh, always have three. And even in my school, they had three consequences. The first one was always a warning. A warning is the children are not in trouble. They are just, you believe in them. You believe they are able to make the right choice. And it's their own choice. They have been talking, maybe. So you warn them. How do you warn them? There are many ways, but I will, I will talk about it later. Here he suggests time out. But to you, it can be, I don't know, you, you establish your way. A second warning is not a warning anymore. It can be a time out. You just go sit at the back for five, ten minutes on your own. But if your class is very boring, sitting at the back, maybe the child will be very happy. So that's why it's, <laughs> that's why it's important. You have an interesting way to bring uh, an activity or a game. or we, We'll talk about it also later. And the next one, what he suggests, I thought it was very interesting, uh, a letter home. It's very, very simple. You have just the rules and just put a little tick beside whatever the child three times, because it's the third one, the third time in one hour that you have to want to talk to that child then it needs to take it home, mom or dad sign it. And it's not so that parents will, but it's that the child will take responsibility for his own action. 
it's not a punishment, it's just he realizes he's, that's him. And they really, um, I'll, come, I'll come to it later. So, I think for this, so now, this is something you could do as a, a group. Everybody teaching the little ones, everybody teaching um, elementary, upper elementary, uh, even, even the youth, if you want to have something, it's up to you. But, and it's not all the groups who will encounter discipline problems. But if it's, it's and, and my point for that is that if someone's disturbing all the time, the other ones are not learning properly. And if you're always warning, 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 nothing happens. So you establish kind of a, a paper on the, on the wall, make it very simple, nothing very flowery and freezy and beautiful because rules are rules. It's, it's serious, it's serious matter. And even you can tell, B, what is rule number two? If she was doing whatever rule number two, did, I think you just broke it. You can write their name on the wall, on um, the wall, sorry, on the board. <laughs> write the name on the board, that's the first warning, or another way that you choose. It's just a warning. Um, but this said, if you set rules, it will not make sure that your classroom is doing well, like Linda was saying, if you don't implement it. If you constantly ignore, oh, normally that child is doing well, so I would just ignore. No, need to be consistent so that after a while, when it's time to be serious, listening, they are. Then when it's time to do activity, they can talk. They can talk. But there's a time for everything. And the teaching time, the prayer time, you know, there are time in Sunday school. It's very important that they are focused. Um, here it says, how to encourage your students to follow the rule is when you establish this. You need to spend some time and explain to them why. Why do we do that? Why do we have rules? Are we going to school? We have rules. Always have rules. Yeah, but this is to help everybody learn and to build inside of you the, the desire to, to do the right thing. There are many stages of discipline. And the top one, the last stage, is when they do the right thing because they know it's the right thing to do. It's not because they will be punished or they will receive a, a reward. No. It's just the right thing to do. And this is the ultimate reward, is when they realize they are capable to be there, to do the right thing, listen, and pray, and think, and they will realize that they are getting more mature. That's a good reward. So why rules exist? It's for them, for their good. Um, consistency is very important. Uh, how to best inform your students of a consequence? If it's a warning, you don't even have to stop your teachings sometimes if if you have exposed everything before when you start this new way if if you want because i'm not saying oh now you from now on you need to work like this but if you decide to go that direction explain to them like what glenda said practice this is how we are going to do this now um you don't have to explain every time. You can just, and then, and then I will use Zacchaeus. And then Zacchaeus, Janice. Zacchaeus, and then Janice knows she was talking. And she knows why I wrote her name there. Um, 
and then I continue my story. I didn't. I don't stop. I don't say, oh, you talked again. You're always talking. You don't have to, because you're not against the child, but you want the the, the child to take responsibility for what he's doing. You, you're not having the problem. The child is doing what he's asked to. No, not now. We're not talking now. We're not standing up and walking around now. If you want to do it, just, just put your hand up. If you want to go to the bathroom, you put your hand up. You know, you know what I mean. So how to best, you can tell them why in the beginning when you start implementing your few rules. Don't have 100, like four is enough, even three. It's, it's as you wish. Um, don't comment. You don't have to say, oh, I wish you stop, or you're always, no, you don't necessarily comment. Well, you broke that rule, and you just keep going. Uh, and don't raise your voice, don't shout at them. And I don't think anybody is doing this here. I don't think so. Um, here they say, just be like a referee and, and move on. Okay. And they, they call it, yours to, um, how do they call it? When I come to it, I will, but it's like, I didn't, I didn't decide this, you did. It's like, it's your choice. You know what you've got to do, and you didn't do it, so it's not my choice. So don't, don't, don't be angry at me, don't be frustrated, it was right there. And also this is something when you start establishing, you talk with them. You, you all get an agreement. And so it, it might take a few weeks or months but eventually they will know the flow uh, and it holds them accountable it's in it okay that's called it they call it it's not me it's you it's not me who's the trouble if i warn you or send you at the back it's not me it's you you chose that's your choice that's what we were calling uh, what we called um make right choices. Okay, so they are accountable. You, you make them accountable. Don't feel guilty and don't excuse. Just, just do it matter of factly and you will see after a while because there are some class, I, I have a list of the classroom and there are a few that are really set for uh, trouble. <laughs> because the children are a certain age, they are more fidgety and more talkative, and maybe you'll have to apply this more with these kids. But if you start them early, they will know. And if you're consistent, you have to be consistent. It's not your rules who will change them. It's the way you will implement. Um, so the warning first means um, it's not personal. It builds trust. You don't give anything. Okay, trust that that, that time you forgot. And maybe uh, you didn't realize you just came out. But I trust that you will that you will do it uh, right the rest of the lesson. Um, it has to be quick and easy. It's quick and easy, and it's stress-free. Uh, the timeout, they suggest, suggest, but you decide, but they say if you could have uh, a desk or a table at the back, and the children are not looking at the person. If the person were, was clowning, doing the clown, making everybody laugh, that person goes to the back, nobody should pay attention. You don't even pay attention to that child. Just continue your lesson and that child will listen to you. And most of the time, if they know the process, one, two, three, the third one, 
my, my mom and dad will know about it. Um, uh, he will most, he or she will most likely just be careful. So they just listen and after a while when you ask them, are you ready to come and participate well? And yes, when you feel they are, they can come back. And the, the letter home, that one I thought is funny, but it can be very, very, very short. It's just so that they know that me and your parents, we talk together. And they need to know. And they need to bring the letter back the next week signed. So, see, this is a responsibility. And if it is not, you contact the parents. <laughs> Maybe it sounds harsh, but I know that bad habits have developed in, in some children. And we want them to learn. And we don't want to label these kids, oh, oh, this one, when he comes, hmm. Oh, when he's not there, oh, wow, everything's like heaven. I know there are children like this, but we can help them change. We can help these children change. So you consider them all equal. Even your most quiet student does one, uh, breaks one of these rules. You give the consequence, the warning, or the time out, because the other children will see, are you fair? You need to be fair with everybody. You don't shout at, any, at anybody. You don't do the look. You don't point your finger. No, you just just do it with love and hoping that it will get better. So all this sounds heavy, doesn't it? Yes. But you can have a lot of fun in your classroom. So much fun that you, ch you will not have problem with your kids or if you have one, just a warning with the, the name on the board or any other system that you decide will just help them to, you know, to uh, get back on track. So how can you have fun in the classroom? Does that mean that you have to go crazy and uh, jump up on the table or dance or be very chaotic? No. It can be an attitude, the way you talk to your kids. Be so prepared that when you come, you don't have to, okay, what, what am I going to talk next? No, you be so prepared that when you come, you can be relaxed, you don't have stress, and you can joke, and you can tell your story, and you can stop, and you can ask questions, and you can make little jokes with them on their personal life, and make it, make it fun. Uh, have some activities, review activities. The material you have has a lot of suggestion of activities activity in the beginning and at the end they always suggest at least three. Sometimes some may be boring. If you think they are boring, I have prepared something for you, one of the booklet we have photocopied. So have fun. Uh, have some rapport with your children. Uh, develop a, a, a relation and Kindness, tenderness, but firm firmness. Okay, you don't you don't accept nonsense. You just don't accept nonsense. Um, I don't know if I may allow myself to say something following what Linda said. Nothing in your hands, but I know some are. If they are fidgety in, those who are hyperactive. In my school, what they allow them to do sometimes is to just give them a little blob of glue tack. So, so the the child, as long as he's not pulling it, you know, and doing all that, and rolling it, and throwing it, but just, just, you say, okay, I allow you to have this, but with a condition. 
keep it for yourself and apparently it is very good it's channeling some of their extra energy because some children have some difficulty but while they are is that true yeah that's true yeah <laughs> I've seen it done a lot to a point where a teacher went overboard and all the kids had one in the classroom but it was too much it was too much <laughs> but make it uh, try to make it to have fun in the classroom uh, and the best incentive is really them changing the best and here it says, okay, I will read it to you and then after I will talk about this. That person says, I believe it's a mistake to reward students for good behavior. Really? And that person says, if you give gift, should be just freely give. Maybe one week you decide they have a sticker. And then he, that's his philosophy. You don't have to agree with all the thoughts that there is, but to me it was, that is, I think that is really true. Because if you reward good behavior, well, that's his way of thinking. He says, rewarding good behavior sends the message to you students that if they have, that if they have to be paid for it, then it must be work. It's like, like the gift is they worked for it, so it's not a gift anymore. It's, it's just, okay, deserve it. Remember, I was, I was good today. I'm, you know, I'm expecting something. But no, be good should be the thing they, have, they, they do. So we're not always rewarded for everything good we do. A reward we have is we feel good about ourselves, and this is something that they must develop with time. Of course, they are children. Um, this effectively, okay, they logically conclude that being well behaved must be something difficult or not noteworthy. Otherwise, why would they be rewarded for it? Uh, reward leads to entitlement. When you offer rewards in return for good behavior, you create in your student a peculiar sense of entitlement. They will feel entitled to receive something for merely doing what they are expected to do. That's, that's what everybody should do. It leads them to believe that they are behaving and following rules for you thus are owed something from you. Uh, after all, if they are getting a reward for it, there must, there must not be anything in it for them. And also it goes on, rewards cheapens the intrinsic motivation. It's like the motivation is not, I have to do the right thing because this is the right thing, but I will do it to get something out of it. So it, it's, it's not developing the right reason why I should be good. And reward for good behavior leads to more and more and more. Just, you always have to buy more and get more stickers or whatever. Instead, the ultimate reward, good behavior, good behavior is its own reward because it offers students self-respect, confidence, and wonderful feeling of belonging to a classroom. Uh, so what they said before, um, a good incentive, the key is in the give is the, you can give, but not because they behave well. Instead of doling out prizes based on what you receive in return, You'll hand them out for no reason at all. In other words, they become no longer an incentive in the traditional sense, but a free gift. It's just a way of seeing it. Uh, don't worry if you've been doing this, you have not sinned against God. Because this is, this is what many, many teachers do. 
anyway. So this said, we have two booklets that we have been um, printing. One is called um, Understanding. I don't know, that's not it. Oh, well, oh, the, uh, okay. Yeah, but you stay up there, I'll do it. Okay, one is called Review Activities. Review Activities. How did you call the other one? Tips for teachers? Training. training. Okay. The other one is called Training. And what I'm going to share to you now comes from another website that I suggest that you take note of. It's called sondayschoolsources.com. It's all one word, sondayschoolsources.com. And when you get into that website, it's, uh, you have lots, lots, lots of uh, suggestions. <laughs> Maybe the first one we could uh, repeat where I took it from. Was it dot com or dot org? Can you repeat this? Here we go. Which one? The first one. Oh, you have it. Okay. Smart classroom <laughs> management. Yeah. SmartClassroomManagement.com, all one word. All one word. Sunday with S. So yeah, if you if you if you had your phone, you could go with me and I could lead you. But we have it on paper. like to look at is called tips for teachers for tips for Sunday school teachers I will go over very quick because you have it so please read it do did you all receive one no oh, you said wait, so. <laughs> may we pass them out now yes please. which one uh, which one training, training. How many did you do? 30. 30. The review activities, there are 30, but I have one here. So if someone have not, has not received it, I'll give it to that person later. Yeah. yeah. We'll do it later. Thank you. So tips for Sunday school teachers, did you all, did you all receive it or yes. not yet? It's very brief, but if you go to the website, there is more. There are, there are more resources, more links. So the first one, it says, um, If you don't know it, they won't learn it. So it's um, it's you need to you need to know. If you want to teach the children, you need to know what you're talking about. You need to read. You need to read the lesson. If it's necessary, read a little bit before the context, even though it's not in the story, because you don't know. Maybe some children will ask you some question. But if you've read the Bible for a long time, of course, you already know. But whatever you're teaching, know what you're talking about. Get your mind thinking early. Start preparing. Just 
looking at it during the week and get your mind. Of course, here they say prepare a craft or an activity, but you already have some in your in your box, but still, maybe sometimes you can think about something else. Teach from the Bible. The, uh, the person who's writing this says that even though all the verses are in the book, she suggests that she reads the verses from the Bible, and if, if even if it's a, it's a possible that the children have their own Bible, because many times they will bring for a while, and we always ring, uh, read from the book, then you don't bring anymore. But um, read, teach from the Bible, and encourage the children to bring their Bible. The only problem is that they have different version. Mm -hmm. So this is something we can, I don't know, we can talk about. It depends their age. If they are little, it's, if they are little, they cannot really read the Bible, you, but you can have your own. Mm -hmm. If they are a bit older, you can adapt or have some in the church. I don't know. This is just, one detail. Get them moving. If they have to sit down for the the whole hour, is it's hard for them. So you can have some activity. Here you will see it talks about review activity, some true and false. This we will see in the booklet. It can just be, okay, now I'm going to ask you some question. Everybody stand, push your chair under the table so it's Space. Okay, I will ask you a question. Uh, uh, true or false? If you think it's true, you all go there. If you think it's false, you go there. You know, things like this. Or um, if you think it's true, uh, you stand up. If you think it's false, you stay seated. Or whatever. Decide some, decide some ways. But try to create because our classrooms are very small so we cannot have them moving so much but make a way they, they can move a little bit around the table or do something have them live it this is something we will have in our review activity maybe act it out sing it um, have a point, and that one is very important. Keep the application firmly in mind. Because over a story, when I was preparing for the Philippines, uh, I think that's the Lord, uh, at one point, I just show me Zacchaeus, the story of Zacchaeus. Ah, yeah. Now, I went online and checked many examples. I, I think I printed five different stories of Zacchaeus. They all had a different point. <laughs> so you need to check, okay, what do they want the children to learn about that story and keep it there? Because a story can have many, many applications. But if that day, they, if you're following kind of a pattern every month with the material you're using every month, they have kind of an overall goal. So keep your activity aimed to that application. Of course, when the children are doing the activities, or whether they are coloring or cutting or doing an art piece, if they have questions that are side, sideways, that, that's fine. You can answer the question. But as much as possible, keep in mind what the application is supposed to be that day. Don't include too much everything related to the issue. Set expectations. Uh, and this is what I talked about before, some expectation. I'm expecting you, I'm expecting you to listen when it's time to listen because I'm going to ask you some question or because if you're talking, the other ones can't hear, 
or I'm expecting you this or that, set your expectation. Uh, you can have times of discussion. Keep in touch with your children, with your student. Here it says, keep in touch with your students. Personally, I've never really done it. Um, what I've done sometimes is bring a little gift. When I was with the youth, it was someone's birthday, and I knew that student was going through a very hard time personally. So I bought a gift to that to that person, and, and you should have seen the face. It came like a light. <laughs> that person was so happy. It was just a little thing. Uh, you don't have to. You can just sing. But if you could know all your children's birthday, and then you can mention about it. And we all have this on the list, on the children's list. I don't know if you have a children's list. Um, and depend on God, of course. Next you have, uh, it's called types of review question to ask. Do you have that? Uh, it's a uh, different kind of questions that you can prepare. Maybe they are not a new material, but you can prepare that. Some are linguistic. They say repeat the memory verse, fill the blank. Well, you already probably have it in your books. Uh, it can be um, other thing. They call it spatial, musical, visual, kinesthetic. Like demonstrate an action, draw an element, sing a song. Uh, you can add to what they suggest. Emotion question. How did the character feel? So there are, there are questions that are not um, yes or no. They have to think. Uh, if you were that person, how do you think you would have felt? You know, things like this. Make them think. What bothered you most? How would you feel? How would you have felt? Uh, these were emotion questions. It can be application question in our life. Like, how should we handle the same situation? I, I believe in your material, you have some of this, but you can always develop more. Uh, when have you come across this, this circumstance? Uh, what could the character have done instead? You know, some application, some facts. Uh, the, ch the little children, are, it's easier for them when it's facts, but you can still ask them a little bit of emotion question. Application, maybe they are too little to, but it can be easy, easy question of application. You, you can just bring about a situation. You know that at that age they, they will live. Uh, facts question and then review question. Here it says, who was the parable directed toward? Of course, the, ch the little children won't know. But make it according to the age of the children. Okay, I think I have gone through. Okay. Now we will pass the review activities. Will there be time at the end for more questions? Or we, we, we must, yeah, there's still more. Yeah, we want to make sure there's enough time I go, for I go fast over yeah. that because it's, it's in the hands. So there might be uh, one person who will not receive one. I, I have it, so I'll, I'll give it later. Because there were 30 and you are 30. And I took one.
Okay. It's very. Um, if you go to the website, you will see all these. You will see even more, much, much, much more. So some suggestion of activities, bingo, review activities, memory ac exercise, acting, drama activities, art project, and song activities. So here they have a suggestion of a bingo. This is a complicated bingo, but you can make it very simple. It can be just some things that were in the, in the story, some important facts, uh, people, object, whatever that you think is important, and you reshuffle it uh, for as, as many children as you have. Okay, it can be a bingo. Review activity. It starts with uh, the word game board, but I didn't print the game board. But if you go to um, the website, you will see some example of game boards that you, you can, they already have some done for certain kind of lessons. But if you, if you examine co correctly, you can have ideas and you can say, okay, I can make one for the lesson that I have. So, alphabet game, Bible baseball. Have you ever heard of Bible baseball? So, this is a Bible baseball. Uh, it's all on the website. Uh, you can draw it on the, you can draw it on your board and you can make two teams and you know how baseball works? Three strikes out, so they change. So you can start by asking question to one team, and if they answer well, they go to the first base, then second base, three, third, and then, or if they don't know, that person is out, but you can ask a second. It's very well explained, but I've seen children in school play maths game using baseball. They had so much fun. It seems simple and maybe almost ridiculous, but you know, they really get into it. But that makes you work. You have to prepare lots of questions. And after three, don't know the answer, so don't make them too easy. And the person who's answering the question uh, is not allowed to receive help from people of his, of his or her team. And anyway, it's, it, it's, it's a suggestion. Bowling, uh, similar to baseball. Campfire, it's if you go camping, if you're in a camp, concentration. So I'm not going to read them all. Please have a look. Fishing, they suggest to do something like this on your board. So you have the hook. And you ask questions, and you either move the hook toward the fish or far from the fish, <laughs> depending if the answer is right or not. You know, these are suggestions. So have a look at this. Uh, maybe it will give you some ideas. And you don't have to take word for word. You can adapt. It can just trigger, ah, I know. I don't have to use their, their idea, but something similar. Be creative. Make it fun. That's why when we talked about discipline, if a child is in timeout and is not allowed to play Bible baseball, hmm, that person will be more <coughs> responsible next time. Make sure that he or she will behave properly. And it's, you know, it's because they want to have fun. Memory activity, if you go to uh, a bit further. Here it says, deal with embarrassment just before. Make, su make sure you read this. Some children are so, so shy that they don't want to do much. So 
you may gain gain the confidence of that child and eventually maybe that child when he sees the other one have fun will start participating memory activity so they have some the verse, the Bible verse, it's important they learn it. You can even go back to last week verse and the week before and the week before. You can have these kinds of activities. And then you have acting and drama. Act it out, uh, broadcast it for, the, for all the kids. They can make a short movie one minute or two minutes movie of a situation that is an application of whatever they have learned, uh, whatever they are suggesting, some uh, acting and drama activities, art project, so they suggest art project, and song activities. This is something I thought was hard uh, and when I was teaching, we hardly ever had time to, to do all of this, but sometimes it can be the activity of song. And a la the last one, I suggest you read it for yourself. It's called Customizing Activities for Your Sunday School Class. If you have a large class or a smaller class, uh, they give all kinds of uh, suggestions. That's very good, and you have the website at the bottom. All right, I'm done with what I had prepared. Now I will ask uh, Amy and Glenda to join. Do you have any questions? Can I just add you're going to add before? You're going to yes. add yeah. some things to yeah. before questions. Okay. Yes. Um, I think it's a great booklet to read because one of the things I, I think it reminded me of an activity which you have I, a microphone, please. <laughs> this is a great booklet. Uh, it reminded me of an activity, the baseball activity reminded me of an acti uh, activity with that which I did with students, just on a green piece of paper, circles marked on there, and a very colourful soccer ball. And the kids teamed up, and you asked them questions, of course, you, relating to whatever. And if they answer the questions, you move two in this direction towards this goal. If they didn't do it, it we move two in the direction. And they just got so engrossed in that. Uh, and of course, you can use it with other kids to put questions can be as easy or as uh, difficult as you want. Um, I was thinking about materials, because um, one of the things particularly I, I was interested when you raised the, the thing about Bibles. You will have kids in your uh, classes who age-wise you might have expectations for, but you may find that their reading ability is not all the same. Mm -hmm. uh, because, that, because some of them are in Chinese schools. Perhaps. Yep. For a variety of reasons, their reading levels will not match. What you don't want to do is embarrass children by asking them to read when perhaps they can't, or when they think they can and they want to try and they're making mistakes all the time and somebody else is having to correct them. That's not a good idea. So it's it's better if the reading material is all the same. I think you need probably need to think about in terms of Bibles, which Bibles you use. But also in the Sunday school materials, if you're asking kids to read, it's much better if you do uh, choral reading with students who are having difficulty. What so do you, you mean by that? You're all reading at the same time. Yeah. You ask the children to follow. Because if you read round independently anyway, the kids work out, oh, paragraph three is mine, so I can just have a fiddle around. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. paragraph three is mine. Um, if you're doing choral reading, you can make sure that they're following. Uh, you can stop uh, at one point and they carry on for a couple of words, you know, if it's a central word, and he said, and you can see whether they're with you because somebody's going to follow on from that. So I would suggest choral reading yes. because you don't want to embarrass a child. They read together. Yeah, they're all reading together. If there was something that you wanted uh, somebody to read independently, if there was a piece from the Bible, I would ask for a volunteer. Don't say it's your turn, your turn. Ask for a volunteer because they know if they're confident enough to want to do it. Um, so just be careful uh, that they're levels are a little bit different and similarly where the activities that you see in the booklets that are recommended and, the, and then in the 
lessons. They're great in there, but you need to take them one step further because otherwise it just becomes a filling in activity, a writing activity, and some of the kids will be able to do it and some of the kids won't and they'll be embarrassed if they can't. Um, so to see a whole selection of things in here where you can take it just a step further and make it interesting. So for example, like the baseball, like a soccer pitch, you could actually build up resources that you just have it almost like a little resource library. Things like that that are not specific for any lesson, but they're just to help you develop your own lesson. Um, I like the bingo. Uh, I think the bingo is a great idea. It's something I use with kids at school. Um, it's usually about reading books uh, to challenge kids that uh, are not reading a selection or a wide selection of books. And so they have to read the books and you tick off the bingo. I do reward kids for that. There are incentives for reward because I think you need to decide in terms of reward, whilst you don't want to be rewarding good behaviour, uh, as such, you do want to actually provide incentives. I mean, uh, there are a few of us, I think, that would be actually doing the work that we're doing now unless we got paid. Um, so the, re <laughs> the reality is that we do work for incentives. Uh, what I do tend to do is, so for example, the bingo, I would make sure the kids know there is a reward for everybody that finishes. It's, there's no winner there is a reward for you. I introduced something for um, my younger kids, uh, it's called 10 for a pen. And um, so they, they get, um, it's not a pen actually, it's a pencil, but they get that $10, it's a colored pencil. It's amazing what they'll do to get that pencil. And so for the younger ones, it's, you know, can you consistently remember 10 words from your sight word list? For the older kids, it's can you over 10 weeks get 70% of your spellings right. And so when they do that, they get the pencil. <laughs> and they know, I have a pencil and it's waiting in Miss Bailey's desk and one day it's going to be mine. <laughs> and um, so they know it's not just as a winner or a loser. You could have something like that for your memory verses, uh, that there's an incentive. Uh, and they come to you when they say, okay, I'm ready now, I, I can do this one today. So you're not pushing them so that they don't say, oh, no, I didn't do it. Uh, but actually they say, yep, I've done it. This, this is my week, I can do it now. And keep a record of whatever it is you're measuring, whether it's a memory verse or something like that. So incentives, yeah, I'm all for incentives. It's nice for the kids to actually work for something that's an incentive uh, for them. But it's important for them to know that they'll actually get one as well. It's not just, well, he always gets there first, he always wins, she always wins, I never win anything. But that actually, if I work hard, uh, I'll get one too. Um, and I, I, it does work, I think. Um, I think there's only one other thing. Uh, having said all the things we've said about behaviour, there's a website I'd like to share with you. Uh, there's a, a lady called Cynthia Tobias, C-Y-N-T-H-I-A. Tobias. As a movie? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, she is a Christian. She's been uh, into Hong Kong. Amy and I had the privilege of hearing her speak. Uh, she's, she's a teacher and a policewoman. Yeah. Wow. That's teacher and a policewoman. That's what and you so, need in a classroom. <laughs> and so, so she has written a book, which you'll see from the title. Yeah. Can you complete and repeat? Cynthia Tobias, C-Y-N-T-H-I-A, Tobias. Um, you, can, you can see stuff that she's done on YouTube. She has written a book, which is, um, maybe we could get that book in church, or I don't know. Uh, you'll see from the title, it would be very helpful. It's called, You Can't Make Me, But I Can Be Persuaded. Uh, and it's tips on how you can help defiant children to actually do what you want them to do. How can you persuade them to do what you want to do? The reason I'm sharing that is not just because of a book, because I realize you're all well busy, you might not have time to read a book. If you register on her website, totally free, she will send you each week a, like a one minute or a one half minute tip what to do with certain children. She's very funny uh, and she's very realistic. 
So I would certainly recommend that you maybe explore that. Maybe take a look, a look at some of the things she's done on YouTube. But if you do register, she will send you an email uh, every week. And it's a visual thing. You just look, one and a half minute tip. Uh, very clear about how to help kids because she is a teacher. Uh, she is a policewoman and she, she has got a defiant child. <laughs> so she's very experienced. Um, I think and she says she was the defiant child as well. So, so the, yeah. in other words, they just look up Cynthia Tobias' website? Yeah. There's not a, a yeah. specific book? I agree, but what book are you recommending? Well, if you wanted a book, it's called You Can't Make Me. Is it the website you're looking for? Uh, well, there's a different one. She's, she's done a woman of strength and purpose because she says she's a very strong, that's a different it's thing. It's, it's, um, it's that it's that. So this same name, same author. same author, yeah, because she was ADHD, I think still is when you hear her speak. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, do you want to talk a little bit about older kids' suggestions? No, just if people have questions. Okay. My, for older kids, it's Wait, pretty come much... Come up here in front so we can... And the microphone. <laughs> For older kids, it's pretty much the same as for the younger kids. <coughs> they need you to keep moving. Yeah. So they need a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And they need energy, uh, especially because they only see you for an hour. Mm -hmm. Energy and passion. Mm -hmm. They respond to if you believe what you're saying. Now, of course, there's sometimes when we're reading scripture, and it's not that we don't believe, but maybe it's not the most passionate thing that we're about. Look for life application. Our teenagers always want to know, how does this relate to me in my life? How is that going to change my life? How does that affect the things that I'm interested in? They're not necessarily, as much as we would like them to be, you know, spiritually minded, God-oriented at various points in their teenage life. But if we can be authentic with them, that we are real, we're real about problems, share what's real in our lives, so don't be afraid to share of yourself, but don't give them all the gory details of your teenage life. Mm -hmm. So don't give them too much information, just enough information. Mm -hmm. And so that they see that you've had real struggles, you've had real life issues that maybe some of them can relate to, and that you know, you're passionate about the Word of God and that it, it does apply to us today. And they won't necessarily be wowed every week, but that you're making a connection with them. That would be the main advice I would give. But keep it moving. They're used to 30 seconds and then changing. Just to follow on to what Amy has said, our children these days, for better or for worse, are children of the iPhone and the iPad and the whatever, and things are, as she said, things are always moving. They, they really are. Things that for most of us, when we grew up, or the way that we learned, it was much slower. We learned, I don't know about you, of course I'm older than many of you, but I learned with a teacher standing in front of the class lecturing. And that was fine for me, that's how everybody did it. Um, but at, I've had to sort of relearn over the years as well, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't work so well. Um, I want to follow up on something that, uh, I know we're gonna have some question and answer time. I want to follow up on something that Sister Bridget said, I have, uh, I have not taught Sunday school much for many, many years now, but I used to teach Sunday school. But also for many years, I, uh, with Sister Betty and with Mom, we three would have summer kids crusades with 100 plus kids of all ages, starting from age three or four up to age 12. And we were responsible, three of us, all of them in one, all of them in one room together. And we really learned all of these things, what Bridget said about, Sister Bridget said about being prepared. Kids were like sharks smelling blood in the water, a drop of water, yeah. a drop of blood. They could tell if we weren't prepared in any way, boom, that was it. And then to try to get them back and get attention again after we'd lost it was so hard. It was, it was much harder to regather their attention and their focus once we had lost it. So we really learned 
You've got to know exactly what you're doing. You've got to be prepared. You've got to have everything ready. And if something doesn't work, you've got to be ready just that fast to switch and go on to something else if, it's, if, it's, if what you have planned doesn't work. I mean, if it's dying in the water, then you change it and you move on to something else. Um, and so we would almost always be prepared with more things than we, than we needed. Uh, so th for, for sure what she said, that you really, kids know when we're not prepared. Kids know when we're winging it. You know, we're not really prepared, but, but we kind of think, I can wing it because I'm an adult and they're kids. But kids can tell it really quickly. They're smart. They're smart. And so we, we're well prepared. We're well prayed up. And the Holy Spirit helps us. So that, that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the big things as well. So uh, I'm going to ask these three ladies if they will. We want to, to uh, uh, first of all, yeah, practice the class. <laughs> <laughs> Pat somebody on the back, <laughs> nicely, gently, let them pat you on the back. <laughs> Come on, Miss Glenda, I'm waiting for a pat. <laughs> a little bit of stretch. Okay. <laughs> okay, sit down again just very quickly. We want to give you a chance to uh, ask a few questions, practical questions, and then we want to feed you some snacks because you've been, we want to reward you because you were so very good <laughs> and listening so quietly. <laughs> I, we don't have 10 for 10, but we've got pizza for, <laughs> we've got pizza for people. <laughs> okay, so... Um, we want to give you a chance to ask some questions. Uh, we give you a chance to ask very specific questions. We need to, if you have really a very, if you have a problem in your classroom, we ask it. Now's the, now's the, the chance. And then we want to uh, give time for a little bit of input as well. So and asking any questions. OK, Ms. Jens. Regarding the rules uh, that we would set for the classroom, um, the problem of Sunday school, people can choose to come and not to come. For newcomers, if they have behavior issue, mm -hmm. shall we implement those strict rules right away, or we should have a transitional period? Should be a transitional. If you're already the age, yeah, yeah. Are you thinking a particular age? Uh, I don't have anything in mind. I, I would say. Just like in a school, uh, we ha we call it an essential agreement. It's not a rule. It's you've decided this is what we think is going to work to make it a, a really good learning environment. So once that's established, even if you've got a new person coming into that environment, I would say do it. Um, you might need to spend a little bit of time explaining to them and saying this was our essential agreement. Most kids will be familiar with that from school. So if you use that kind of vocabulary, essential agreement, these are the things that are going to, that makes it a happy place and a nice learning environment. These are our expectations. And you haven't got a long list, Bridget, saying three, four at the most. Say these are our expectations. Just take five minutes to talk with that child personally. Welcome them into the classroom. Say that, you know, this is a nice learning environment for us. This is, uh, this is what we will expect from you. This is what you can expect from us. And I would say from day one, you use that. How did you call it? Essential? Essential agreement. Maybe uh, we can write it down instead of the word rule. Essential use this kind of terminology because that's that sounds different as rules. In uh, my school, not all teachers agree to do that, but they, uh, they decided they agreed on these rules with the students. They say, okay, what do you think would be uh, essential so that everybody is learning well? And of course they say, not talking and not do this. So they know. So you you put a, a few together. It's, it's, this is when you come and say, make the right choices, like not hit, not this, not that. Okay, make right choices. It can be one, and they all know what the right thing is. 
and put your hand up, you know. So that's why, and then after the teach, after they decided on a few rules, everybody signed it around. So that's, the, it became an essential agreement. I, I, I'm happy that you brought it up. It's better than rules. Yeah. And, if you, and if you have a new student, uh, rather than the teacher giving it, you could ask the kids, well, we've got a visitor, oh, yes. let's, let's see, let's let the visitor know how we do it in our room. Can you tell me, what's rule, what are some of our rules? And they can, you know, you point to the essential agreement and, yes. and let the kids tell the other child, this is what we do here. Just a practical application and to our settings here, because in many schools you have a homeroom teachers, so it's the one dealing with the essential rules. We have a turnaround of different teachers, so how can we implement these, introduce them, and that each teachers of the same groups uh, are consistent with the application of that, because that's that's the success or, or not of the, 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 this system. I think that's where it'd be good if you met with your team and talk about what can you all support, what can you all do, what is the real essential bits, and then have make your poster. The kids can sign if you want to do that way. And then have the poster up so that if I'm teaching today, oh yeah, this is what we've decided. So review to yourself. Make sure you come into the classroom knowing what the established rules were that you've all agreed. So the, but the teachers should talk about that first together in your classroom. So the, the younger ones might have a slightly different set of agreements than the older ones or the, or the teens. But they should still all have an agreement about, yes, this is our expectation. So if I'm meeting with the teenagers, I should know in that situation, if I'm coming in, maybe I'm not even the regular teacher and I'm just filling in for today. Oh, I can see they've got a poster. Okay, this is what these this age is supposed to. Then I know what to expect of them regardless of whether I'm a new teacher or, or I've been part of the group for a long time. But you should meet first and discuss that. How about if our visitor is a special child? What can we do? Probably your visitors are not the only special children. There are probably some special children in church already, so it's good if we know some strategies already. Probably for a lot of our special kids, having clear rules is actually step number one and enforcing those rules. That's probably one of the bigger steps at the beginning uh, in terms of the kids with maybe some behavior problems. A lot of the behavior problems will decrease if we can all consistently do that. The problem will come is if I do this one Sunday, the next teacher does it the other Sunday, and then what we've said are the rules become a joke. And that's when things go badly. So that's why it's really important that you talk together in your team. Yes, these are the rules we're going to follow, and you do, just do it. So the new kid will probably fit in easier, even if they have a special need, because they'll have the others helping them along. And, and kids learn. B's got a question. And kids learn so quickly. And a lot of you already know the kids in your Sunday school classes. They already know you, don't they? And so it's so kids know very quickly, this teacher's boundaries are here. This teacher's boundaries yes, are here, yes. and their behavior will automatically, their behavior will move to the limits of the boundaries, of the boundaries that they know you set for them. And so I think it's really important, uh, as you heard them say, uh, that it's there's consistency in guidelines or es essential, essential, essential agreement, and then you've got to keep the essential agreement. It's, it's got to be, you can't say, okay, okay, well, whatever, because all that does is it changes the essential agreement and it pushes, pushes those boundaries out. And um, the kids won't learn, so it's doing them a disservice, and you will be so disheartened for, because it's like, you feel like all you're doing is, is, uh, is uh, discipline or whatever, when, when in fact, that's not the point of, a, of, of your Sunday school classes. Your point is to, they encounter Jesus and they, they're loved and, and all of these things. So all of much of what they've been talking about, they're it's it's to get it, it's you want your kids to get to the place where they can where they can meet Jesus and learn about Jesus. So. But maybe some of the yes, special yes. isn't behavior, if it's not behavior and it's maybe more of a learning difficulty, then I would say that if it's a visitor or a kid that's already in our Sunday school, try to partner them up with somebody that they can work well with, get along well with and learn together with. So maybe I'm not a very good reader, but Glenda's a good reader. Okay, let's match up. 
if we're always fighting with each other or if we are busy talking and chatting and never work well together, then don't pair us up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could be. Okay. Okay. <laughs> the, the other was next. Um, in, I know that our church um, not doing that in the moment. I think, uh, in terms of um, measurement or progress of the of each child, do you think um, in Sunday school setting in the church that we should um, have this type of um, progress or I mean, so that the the kid know how well they do and the parent will know with is it a good idea I, I'm, it's, a, it's a question because sometimes we have all these uh, things happening or whatever um, week to weeks month to month and the kid is growing every year they get promoted to Sunday school but in terms of at the end of it or like you know yearly or half yearly would it be a good things to do I don't know what they call it but at least they will know how well am I, am I behaving good enough? Am I doing my memory so good? Enough? It's sort of like a report card. Well, when we say report, I mean like progress, <laughs> like a, like a, so that the, the kid know, not just the parent. Probably also the kid. it would be yeah. very good, but the trouble would be if there are many Sunday school teachers. Yes. Then it becomes problematic because maybe I see them once a month or maybe even less, and what I think might be different from uh, the other teacher. So then that becomes more where it's a bit more challenging. Uh, but maybe you would want to meet every middle of the year or end of the year and talk about, you know, could we write a note to the parents about maybe just a paragraph, but then you'd want to look at your goals, like what were your topics that you learned about this year? But you need to be willing to make that time. It would be very, quite time consuming, so it would be something that you'd have to really commit to. Don't do it once and then not do it again. So it should probably be something that you talk about in your Sunday school department. Maybe by group, uh, they would meet uh, after so many months. The, yeah. the, all the teachers of this particular group, then you discuss it, then you come up with and some And do it for everybody, of, not just your problem kids. Yes. Although I, do, I think you could probably achieve the same kind of thing just by doing some of those achievement things like the bingo, you know, depending on what those things were that the kids had to do. You know, parents will see that on a week by week basis as my child being doing his memory verses has he achieved that? Yeah. You, you can show that through other things. You don't necessarily have to formalize it. With it all. Otherwise, it becomes a little bit like too much like school, and there's a lot of yeah. pressure. You want it to be fun, but you do want them to be learning. But And the, and the other thing is, what are we measuring? Are you going to measure their academic progress and the knowledge of the Bible, or are we looking at their spiritual development? And that's, yeah. that's a difficult one. Just a second. Um, so we're We've been talking, we're in the process of talking about assessment and, and, and uh, sometimes uh, discipline issues and things like that. And there may come a time when it has to reach the parent in some way. But we also want to encourage you, we would say this as pastors, uh, one of the things that we have found, and I know sometimes when I talk with you or when I talk, if you're a parent or I talk with parents in the church, there's sometimes when I see something that's really good in a child, you know, I see something that they've done really well or they were oh my gracious, if I go to a parent and say, hey, you know, I noticed whatever, and I'm saying something positive about their child, honest, you know, not just kind of poof, making up something or whatever, that does so much. It does something for the parents as well and for the children to know, to know hey, this, this teacher cares about my children, about my child, is invested in my child, and, and it, it helps to reinforce every good thing you want to do in the Sunday school classroom as well. And that's a, I, I tell you, we would say as pastors, what you do in the Sunday school classroom affects the whole family in the church. It really, it really, really does. And I think sometimes you're not aware of how strong an influence you have uh, on that on that family's experience with church beyond what Pastor Renee and I do um, on the second floor as we're preaching, as we're interacting. So, so keep that in mind as well. I think that would probably be more important, actually, than even a, a progress report, is to get back to mom and dad now and, all, now and then and let them know what's going on. Because when it happens, it's just like kids, right? It's better to tell them as it's happening rather than you know, at the end yeah, of a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. I think also one of the things 
going back to working as a group and deciding things as a group. You know, in the uh, you know, how do you get the kids' attention? Deciding what your particular group is going to do about that and uh, what your essential agreement is. The other thing I would say about supporting each other as a group is that um, general respect. The kids need to know that you are the Sunday school teacher. You respect them, and you, your expectation is that they will respect you. And one of the things that we found at school is that teachers seem to be here, educational assistants are here, and janitors are kind of somewhere down here. And one of the things we do try to do at school is to show the kids, we are all adults. The teachers, the EAs, the janitor, we're adults. And if we are speaking to you, we, we expect respect as an adult, regardless of what our status is. And I think that you need to maybe work together as a group to help each other in that. So for example, at school, if a child will come to me and they've been complaining to an EA, they see me arrive, oh, he's a better person to complain to, I, I will step back from that and say, no, it's, it's being dealt with. Um, so for, for you all to work together in terms of supporting each other in your role as Sunday school teacher. Because the kids, particularly in Hong Kong, get just a bit confused in some areas and you need to help them to understand that in your role as Sunday school teacher, you command that respect. While you'll give respect, you expect respect. After an hour, <laughs> we were Thank safe you. here. Once you hear what you have to say. Uh, no, um, is it? I'm just suggesting that because we have a lot of turnaround. Some of them have one month turnaround of teaching. Some of them have two weeks. Um, I think it would be good to have like quarterly. All the teachers would stand in front and tell, like one person will tell the rules so that they, the others will know the rules. <laughs> and they are not making up, at least they are all like on the same page. Yeah. You mean the essential agreement? <laughs> yeah, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So at least, because sometimes it's- You it's should review those essential agreements yeah. as often as you need to. So yeah. sometimes it might be that you do it every week. Mm -hmm. Some teachers, it might be the best way to start the lesson. Just a quick, what are our rules? Okay, one, two, three, four. Ready to go? Let's go with the lesson. So whatever you think you need, and especially if you're new, you've been away for a month, now it's you again? Yep, do it. What are the rules again? How would you suggest that uh, this, uh, in a team, they implement these rules? Like, wh what would be some steps to prepare these rules? You, mean, you mentioned with the students, but they are not all there. And then the communications and the implementations, having different personalities of teachers. Well, what would be some advice to go with this sort of uh, well, setup? I would say we have open essential agreements at school. So the teachers meet with their class to Can decide. We have an open essential agreement. So the teacher meets with their class to decide the essential agreements. What will make our classroom a happy place? In order to get a holistic approach, the teachers have already met to decide what will be the essential agreements. And so the classroom essential agreements are basically the adults steering them into what would be a good essential agreement. So they're going to be kind of general, like that they're going to be respectful of each other, uh, that they're going to be uh, a good listener. It could be something very general general like that but we have already met as teachers to decide what do we want on that list of essential agreements the way it's written up might be quite different but the basic things you would have decided ahead of time and so the person that's introducing that would need to make sure they steer the kids into it rather than saying okay your teachers have met and these are the essential agreements you'd need to just steer them into that Can I say something? I just want to say that it seems to be like a new thing and we are <gasps> but I tell you if we start something and we apply it I tell you and a few months time nobody's talking about it it's all part of classroom it's like you don't have to go through that all the time it's going to be known it's, it's going to it's like when you start your car and you start going. 
then you not you're not starting your car the whole time you're driving between here to home so you started it then you're rolling and and my point is once it started once it started it's rolling you might have to f make a few correction explanation review repetition but once it's going it's going we don't even think about it anymore we're all into it i don't know if you understand what i mean yeah. yes moses has a question moses, uh, the question is about this es essential agreement which um, uh, you guys have been talking about it's whether that would include the consequences because as uh, pastor jennifer and others and you guys were all talking about how the case manipulates adults you know what you like what you don't like so if there's some sort of guideline wherein the teachers agree what are the you know they uh, should be written there too as part of the yeah okay. the essential agreement and the consequences and if you want to talk about rewards then you can explain to them the way i was explaining it that rewards for good behavior, no. Rewards for working hard, yes. Rewards for making effort, yes. Good behavior, the rewards is they will feel good about them. And these rules are not for them to be, to receive a reward, but it's for everybody that they will learn well and they will be happy and they will be safe. But they, yeah, they should, me. You decide what you want to do. That should be the conversation when you make the rules is also what it is. As a group. As a group. But make sure the consequences, whatever method you choose, is something that you can really do. And like, Jen, uh, like Bridget was saying, it's better if it's something that you can keep impersonal. It's better if it's something that you can keep impersonal. Because if I can write somebody's name up and I don't have to stop what I'm doing, I don't have to make a big deal, I don't have to embarrass or you know, say anything big to that person, whatever they're doing, I can just write their name. They have already figured out probably what it is. Maybe by the third, second time, I maybe, maybe need to address them more directly. But the less time that we waste, the more it becomes about what we're teaching and not about the bad behavior. But we should meet in our groups to decide because if we decide, let's say it's the name on the board, and then somebody tries to do something else, and then the next Sunday it's something else, the kids will get confused. And then you'll spend all your time on classroom management. Picking one way that everybody can do will speed it up so that it's not about the classroom management. It should be about the lesson. Other questions? Yeah, Jennifer, you mentioned in terms of different levels of the reading, um, reading skills or even different type of skill set the children have during the classroom, right? How did the, how should the teacher um, using it to not making other, other children they are less um, capable than the other? For example, you say one kid may be better in reading, the other are not. Um, how, how did the teacher do it in a way that the one not very good at reading, he, he doesn't feel I'm, I'm, I'm bad at reading. It, I don't know. it all depends on you knowing your children. So you need to, as quickly as you can, get to know your children. Get to know the schools that they're going to, the background that they have, their academic ability. And you can get that through general conversation with children and just in the activities that they do. And you think, oh, that child's a little bit slow on there, doesn't seem to be able to, you know, he's only counting back two squares and he's gone three. Just getting that information yourself. But I would say very specifically in terms of reading, don't ask children to read individually unless you really know they can. If you're not sure, ask for a volunteer. But the best thing in, in just a one hour session, I would do choral reading. In my reading lessons for children with poor ability, I always use choral reading. And then I find that the children are weak, they miss that word out, and they join us when it comes to the easy word. They miss word, that word out, and they join us. But there's no interruption because there's reading throughout because you've got a group of children reading. Um, so 
uh, I would just not single them out. Same way for any follow-up up activities if there's any writing involved. Um, you can either get them to work in pairs, if you think there's maybe a weak child in that group, get them to work in twos or in threes to do an activity, or if they're doing an individual activity, you can say, oh, you can work together, you can help each other. That's not a problem. Uh, obviously, don't put two badly behaved children to work together, you know, but you can say, would you like a partner for this activity? Just don't single them out unless you really know those kids. The other thing that I would say on that one is also this is why it's important that you have variety in your lesson. If all of your lesson is reading and they're not a good reader, and maybe they're not a very good listener either, maybe they don't understand well just from listening, it's important to have things that they can see, things that they can listen to, and move your activity along. Because if somebody's not a good reader or not a good writer, an hour is a long time. And by 20 minutes, they'll be ready to be naughty and some of them will find naughtier things to do than others some of them won't be naughty but they won't be listening they won't be very happy to be there and pretty soon it's like church is the most boring thing ever <laughs> right and when they're teenagers you can forget about getting them to church so this is why it's important with whatever age do crafts, do painting, do, do things that involve something other than only the reading and the writing. Because an, otherwise an hour is a very long time to do something you're not good at. Jess has a question, but let me, let me just share this to follow up on what Amy was saying. <laughs> of course, they're still learning as well, but my heart was so sad a few months ago when one of the Nepali kids came out of the class and came to me and said, Pastor Jennifer, Sunday school was so boring. All the teacher did was just talk about Jesus the whole time. <laughs> and that was, that, now that child has continued to come, but I was, inside I was laughing. But, but I was kind of, mm, because, so for that child it was like, okay, it was just talking about Jesus the whole time. Um, and, and, and in fact, that's a pretty good challenge for us if a child thinks, well, it was just talking about Jesus the whole time and that was boring, because we know Jesus isn't boring. Um, and you we learn. sing about him. That's you can right. do other things about him. That's, that's right. You can, play, you can reenact it or, or this or that or whatever. So, But I've kind of laughed and kind of cringed about that afterwards. So, Jess, you have a question. Well, because this morning, you know, uh, the kids are, uh, were asking me, can you be a... Uh, I, are you my, our teacher next week? So yes. Can you be our teacher again the, for the rest of this month? And why? Because I don't like the other teachers. <laughs> so, uh, I have a very hard time to explain that you have to love your teachers because they're doing great. But that's their, you know, what that's what they feel. I don't like the teachers. So, so if like that, then we have a hard time catching their attention about the lesson, focusing the lesson. I, they don't like the teachers. So how can we deal with that kids that they don't like the teachers? How can we motivate them to like the teacher? Well, I, th I think it's, it's, it's very hard, but I think the, the first thing is you, you shouldn't take a side. You know, I mean, you can't say, oh, yeah, she's kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just pointing out differences. Everybody's different. You know, you and I get along really well together, and it's not great. And I'm sure those other teachers get along really well with other kids, and we've just got to ac accepting the differences, really. But maybe even in your group uh, situation, I mean, obviously not tackling it so insensitive and direct, but maybe making suggestions. Find it, what is it that the kids like about your class? You know, if you asked yourself, what is it that the kids like about your class? Why do they like coming out? Why is it fun? Um, and maybe sharing some of those ideas with the others in the group that you're working with. That would be helpful. Um, I think many, many of us, we, we learn by example or by seeing. Like if I go to a website and I find resources and somebody uh, does a mime or, or some artistic things, I can learn and I can implement. And I think in, in our group, we have uh, maybe um, a, a lack of uh, access 
to resources and ideas and creative ideas. So we can only do what we know how to do. So like the, the one says, oh, my teachers only talk about Jesus. Uh, well, maybe that's the only thing that I know how to do it. But if we share ideas and resources and go deeper than just sharing about Jesus, the reading and the talking, then we will uh, um, improve. So how could we uh, come together and share things that works, things that are more creative, ideas, crafts, uh, this kind of things, uh, the, the more artistic and the more application, that we could share it uh, together so that we all can grow. And some of us are more shy, we are new, we have been assistant, but we have n no uh, training and uh, educational training. So at least we can learn something more and pick up here and there. I think we could encourage you, especially if, if you feel I'm not a particularly creative teacher, and, so, and some of us may be that way, uh, or I'm new and I'm still learning. Find out some, there may be some that are, that are, are you know they're good teachers in the Sunday school, and just ask them, may I come in and sit in your class? Uh, may I be your assistant for a Sunday? Just to get some, just to get some ideas. And the other thing I have found is this. There are always some people who are more naturally creative than others. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Just as there are some that are more naturally something than others. But in general, creativity is hard work. It really is. To be creative in the classroom, we have to have spent quite a lot of time outside of the classroom so that when we get into the classroom, then what comes out is something that is, uh, it's a variety, it's interesting to the kids. The easiest thing in the world to do, and actually what takes the least uh, uh, creativity and the least effort on our part, is for us as teachers to have all the material, and I stand in front of the class, and I do all the talking, and I tell all the kids what to do, and everything, and now fill this and now that, and they have very little interaction or input that's active, except to write and fill in the blank and color and do whatever I tell them to do. That's the easiest way for me to teach a class, but probably for most kids, especially these days, that will be the least interactive and the, l the class that will they will have the least learning experience in and the least enjoyability in, I think, I think. Yeah. Uh, question? I have nothing. Question. You know, adding to, uh, adding to what it says that I think that a regular meeting with a group of the teachers would be helpful because that's when you build up what uh, your students uh, know me well. So I think that's what I thought that would be helpful. I don't know how, in terms of practical uh, organization you have, but one of the best ways to, to learn, also you know, uh, YouTube and things like that, but one of the best ways to learn is to watch somebody else doing it. So, I mean, I don't know whether you have a week where it's, you know, you said somebody does it for a month and then you have a change. Is it a quick change, you know, like you've been doing it for a month and now it's somebody else doing it for a month? Or is there any overlap? So I'm thinking, like, if, if you know, if you were working for two, I, I don't know what the logistics is, but say if you were doing three weeks, could the, the last week be the first week of the next person's so that there's an effective handover yes. so that you can see the essential agreements, you can see the behavior in the classroom. The kids know, okay, yes, I can't just change this week because she saw me last week doing this. I mean, that's that basically that's what happens in schools if somebody's going to take over for a few weeks uh, the, the teacher coming in will, will spend a couple of days in that classroom to see, just testing out the land, see how it works. And that overlap would give you an opportunity of watching somebody else doing it, getting some ideas, maybe making some on-the-spot suggestions, helping them with their practical application. And if there was a, a game to play, two years better than one to do it. It doesn't have to be every week, just to maybe have some overlap would help you. Mm, I don't know. That's, that's a, a suggestion. Good, that's, that's a very, very good, idea. good idea, yeah. Maybe that's some maybe to follow up on that rather than uh, rather from the rather than from the top down telling you okay now you do this overlap maybe within your groups uh, if you would get together about that and think about how that might work I think that's a great suggestion question about the uh, cell phone just a practical question so do we have any uh, uh, policy policies uh, rules guidelines about uh, we use, we read, we confiscate at the beginning of the class, we use it as our Bible reading. What, what do we do with the children and the cell phone? Are we talking teenagers or younger? Uh, I'm just uh, I'd say raising the teenagers. question. Yeah. Is, it, is it a problem? I've heard with some of the youth, 
it, it seems with the youth it's too easy to go from reading my Bible to all sorts of other things. So they, from, they, from what you all have said, we've heard. It's too what? It's too difficult? It's too easy to go it's from too. really reading the Bible to... Add it to your essential agreement? Uh, maybe add it to your essential agreement, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, people have the essential agreement, yeah. like that when they go out for a meal, put your phone to the window and say, I'm going to touch it. Actually, when, um, they can use it when we read the uh, verses, but as I teach, I go around and checking if they're still on the Bible area. And if not, so sometimes they are quick, then I said, go back to the Bible. Because sometimes they immediately go to the games. Yeah. But because I'm walking Maybe I around. Just take it but, yes, I, I think I would just take it out of the classroom. Yes, let them, let them also, use the Bible. Because I'll if you Bible. have to manage yeah. that all the time, probably with the same students as well. Yeah, but then they easily know. They focus on them. Yes, but uh, the advice today was avoid always to have to manage the rules. Prevent. Yeah. Prevent. Pre prevention. Pre prevention is better than uh, yeah. always getting the rules and the corrections. We, we are happy. We, we believe this would be an excellent investment. We've done it with one or two of the classes already. We can work out something so that um, there are age-appropriate Bibles in mm -hmm. the classrooms uh, so that so that the children are reading the same thing and using the same thing we can do that. Yeah, yeah, we can we can we can work on that's something we can work on. Okay. Just one last uh, question. Yes, Moses. How do you I mean we're not all experts here. Some of us are new here. How do you deal with a question from a child that you you're not familiar with and uh, you don't have the right answer or you don't even know? Or you don't want to talk about something very sensitive. Uh, how do you deal with those sorts of situations? Tell them you don't know. <laughs> yeah, tell them you always no, don't make but, it up. Okay, so wait, it's too, it's too sometimes he it's knows, but it's too sensitive to be discussed. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So it's wait. So one is it's I don't know, or if it is a question. If it's, it's too a sensitive, sensitive thing, and that happens at school too, you know that's a really great question. But that might be something you need to talk to mom and dad with, or is there an adult that you trust that that is something you should talk to them about? I wouldn't say it's not something we shouldn't talk about in Sunday school because then it gives them the idea of, you know, we want to put, you know, here's here's the religion box and then real life is over here. So we don't want to give them that idea, but we also don't necessarily, as you said, want to go into every topic that some kids might want to bring up. Bring up. So, but don't always only point them to the to the parents because sometimes their issues are with their parents, and so bring up the trusted adult idea. So that maybe it's not just you, but uh, is there somebody and else? Maybe that discuss type? with other people if it is like a very special questions or something you're learning at the same time that it, it should be dealt with. Then you need to follow up either with, I think uh, Janice is the the, the, the relation the between yeah. the Sunday schools and the pastors and the parents or something. And then you start there. And if it's very serious, maybe she can talk to the pastors or. At least there's a, there's a step beginning to, to, to go toward the, the solution of that problem. I'd like to piggyback on that question. Um, it's an issue that's come up at my school, and that's about, and this may be a sensitive topic, but I think it's important to talk about, uh, child abuse. In schools, we are, I'm a teacher, I am required to mention it to my supervisor and for my supervisor to follow up. I don't know what the law in Hong Kong is, but the law in Canada is the same for any organization that deals with young people, children, young people. So essentially churches at home have the same responsibility. So let's say the sensitive thing that's coming up is about abuse. Could be verbal, could be physical. You don't necessarily want to talk about it there. Uh, if it's a boy and talking to a man, also different than the girl talking to a man. So you would want to direct them to somebody of the same sex to talk about the problem, uh, but not in front of the kids. And if you're not comfortable, then it should probably go to Janice if you're the Sunday school superintendent or whatever title we want to call it, because it is important that if a child is telling us something important like that, that we don't pretend we didn't hear. We do need to investigate. Uh, Kids don't always tell the truth, but in some of those aspects, most of the time they won't. But there are some kids that do, and that's why they need to investigate. Uh, in my school, my superintendent or my um, 
Who do I want to say? Supervisor. My supervisor, the head of my department, will investigate. And then, if it seems like this is a legitimate problem, she is required to phone the police or social services. So it's a very important issue. And sadly, it's not. Does, these things don't not happen in church. We'd like to think that none of this ever happens in church. But actually, if you're a trusted adult, you may find out some unpleasant things. Maybe it doesn't happen in the church, but maybe it's some of our church kids experiencing things elsewhere. We don't know. So if you do hear about it, please don't ignore. If you're not comfortable talking to the child, send them to somebody that you think can deal with it. One of the pastors, we've got a male pastor, a female pastor, we've got Janice. Please don't ask them to ignore or not talk about it. Ask them to, to talk about it later if they're bringing it up in class. I wouldn't talk about it in front of the ki other kids. But please do not ignore. Mm -hmm. yeah, you can say, um, that's a very good question. Let's talk about it when the children go and you and I can talk about it. Go for a general question. Yes, and then when question. you find out the topic, then. Because often, uh, if, if they're saying something, I'm not a trained teacher as Amy and, and these others are in the same way, but if they have said something to you about it, most likely there is a feeling of trust on their part and a feeling of care and love that they are willing to open up to you in that area. So that's a, a trust and a care that, w that we must hold in a very precious, in a very, very precious way. Uh, um, a few months ago, um, one of the children was sitting next to me in church while we were while we were singing. We were singing, "You are good, good, so good." It was over and over and over again. And the child looked at me and asked and said, "Why are we saying that over and over and over and over again?" And so I just leaned out and I said, "I said because God really is good, and you can always trust Him, and He'll always be with you." And the child immediately looked at me and said, "My dad doesn't live with me anymore." It was just it, it was just that fast because it was something that touched his heart, mm -hmm. oh, but, but God is good, and so he was thinking of God as father and then his own father, and so, and some, sometimes if it's something like that, if it's just an emotional pain or a hurt issue, it's not, it doesn't rise to the level of what Amy yeah, no, is talking yeah, yeah. about a, a, at all, but what it does mean is God has entrusted you with that small child and, and, and that heart that is, has been hurt and is painful, and it's something that you can you can pray yeah. for that child. You can spend more time. You can you can God God can use you to bring healing to that child. So that it is it's it's precious and it's important. Yeah. I read um, something and I kind of implemented it when I went to the Philippines. But it was more with older children. It's um, like teenagers and maybe preteens have a lot of questions and they feel that church don't address these questions. Uh, maybe about the Bible, about God, about sexuality, about uh, a lot of things, friendship, family. It can be a lot of things. And uh, so, and so I, I was looking at some website. They have 50 questions that teens are asking, and uh, 100 questions, 41 questions, 19 questions, or whatever. So uh, this is something also that we, we need to be aware of. There are questions that the older kids will have that are difficult sometimes to answer because it just doesn't make sense. They've always been told in Sunday school, oh, the easy answer, uh, who is the greatest person? Jesus! Oh, yes, of course we are Christian, we always say Jesus. But then, oh, but why is there this problem? If God is good, why is there evil in the world? You know, like this kind of thing. So a, a lot of teenagers or preteens are... A, they are in the uh, psychological development stage. These questions become a reality and very important. And many churches, we just don't talk about these yeah. things. Just talk about Jesus. Give them a verse, and then that would be enough. But some of these issues needs to be uh, addressed with the older children. You need to tell them how you make them ask them. questions. Well, in the Philippines, I tried something because some of their websites were from America. So, and I was quite many questions, but I didn't know how to, uh, because it was my first time to do that. So with the other pastors, we talked among ourselves, and we gave a paper to each of the teenagers, 
and we asked them and I gave them examples of questions because sometimes if you just say ask a question they will say like a like an easy question but I said okay here are some of the questions that teenagers in America are asking maybe you do have your own questions so would you write it on a piece of paper and they were wow amazing questions we wrote it in the piece of paper I was going to share with Pastor Jennifer about some of these that are worth uh, thinking preparing and to come back and answer these questions because if we don't answer that it's like the church don't have answers for for a real problem mm -hmm. and that, 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 that is the time when they will start to, yeah. to believe that uh, uh, evolution is true that the world has more that science is more important than the church but we believe that God has answers mm -hmm. for the real life issues of, of children and families to a question where you feel like you need to say I don't know say I don't know but I'll try to find out but always bring it back to them as well you should also try to find out get them to do some searching because some of them are very passive about what they yeah. think about the Bible and it's only what you've told them in Sunday school get them to do some of that thinking as well I have a few things want to follow through like we talk about we need to know our children how to because we're rotating, um, probably I don't have time to talk to them, know more about them. I think we need to think further how to organize ourselves within the class with the leader or whoever. Um, I talk to these children this time, I write it down. I know something about that, they are facing this problem. We write it down, how do we communicate among the, the team member? How they like can the sharing of confidential or personal exactly. or sensitive information yes. within so, the class. Okay. Yeah. Yes. This child is facing some difficulties, so yeah. the, the, the teacher handling in this one, or he, she or he knows it. So maybe he can give some encouragement or something like that. I think among the team, we can think about how we can build this up. And about creative, some people are more creative, I'm not creative at all. Mm -hmm. So someone is really a creative, and many teachers, they have years of experience. They have so many ideas. I see the decoration downstairs, can we have the resources or people just collect different ideas in a, a key or something like that so people can share? People maybe they just. We have just recently gotten some resources. Exactly. Children's Ministry Smart Pages, Preschool Smart Pages. We, we're ordering some things now so that okay. to have some resources as well. So they can share. And regarding these, work with parents. My, ch my children grow up here, I never talk to any Sunday school teacher. So when a Sunday school talk to you, Sunday school teacher, teacher talk to you, maybe something bad. I think it's good to have a regular chatting. Like Francis, you go to see the teacher 10 minutes. And Francis is so excited, you're going to see my teacher, right? So something bad, something good, I think it's just a chit chat. As teacher, they are very skillful. They always tell you the good thing, but in read between the lines, you know something. As parents, we may need to support the child in the house. So I think it would be good for the parents to know this kind of thing. Maybe my child always behaves, but maybe he's not respectful to the Sunday school teacher. We don't even know. Mm. But the Sunday school teacher may not want to tell me mm. because you but know. if you're now following the three strikes on the essential agreement, <laughs> mom and dad ah. should know within the month. <laughs> okay, so do we have a letter template that, okay, the leader can, okay, we should send the letter if someone is not behaving, those kind of things. I think we may need more support in organizing it. Whoever is the leader, how do they want to do it, how regular they want to meet, if there are questions, are they go to the experts. So I think we need to organize that. Okay. Yeah, I think, yeah, something like that. And I have a comment also. Yes. You need bifocals, Janice. Huh? You need bifocals, Janice. When I switched to progressives, the, the, the ophthalmologist, he looked to me, and he checked, and he looked at me, he said, Jennifer, he's a family friend, he said, Jennifer, you have fought the good fight long enough. It's time to give in. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but that's a good point. Maybe in that area of a letter follow-up or whatever, if that's something that we're generally in agreement with, maybe um, with you three, yeah, maybe we could get some. Oh, it has a template. Ah, okay. 
sorry, I cut you off with your comment about your glasses. Anything? <laughs> I just recognized it. <laughs> Okay. Just, uh, just to say, um, planning-wise, if there's any craft you want, just look on Pinterest. It's marvelous. Oh, yeah. Pinterest yes. I live in. Does okay. everyone know Pinterest? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So yeah. that's what I use loads of times. Loads yes. of craft. Brother Bono, do you know Pinterest? No. It's wonderful. Oh, dear, here we go. Where's that green pen? Okay. <laughs> it's the best thing ever. It's, it's, it, it's really great. I have, I have uh, talking about that, I have a question. Like, Brother Bona. Do you have a computer at home? No. Okay, so many of our sisters also don't have a computer at home. Okay. Or oh, they have, a, they have a, a, phone, a phone. But sometimes you, you need a little bit more than a phone. So if that's the case, maybe we could help to organize some laptops or some sorts of things that you could have access here while you are here and preparing for next month. And then all of these websites, you come and you, you stay one hour or something Sunday afternoon, or, or you come during office hours during the week if, if it is possible for you, and you access some of these resources here in the church that we could make available to you. Are the libraries, do they have them over here? I'm well, sorry? Do the libraries here have computers? You mean the public libraries? Public libraries, like in the UK, public libraries, you get computers. Yes. Thank you for mentioning that. That's yeah, public, mind, public libraries. Public libraries. Can you go to public libraries anywhere in Hong Kong? Yeah. 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 It's 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 free. So anyway, whoever, whatever. If you don't have a computer, talk to us or go to public library. But maybe you need to uh, exercise or get the books that Pastor Jennifer has uh, ordered and things. We will, we're going to make these available. I think for right now, we, we, what we'll ask you not to... Uh, Go not, home. Not, not, yeah, don't let them gather feet, but you're, you're welcome to look at it. We'll start uh, sending out some of these things. Uh, the time is getting really long, and you've been very patient. Some of you are on, on stools, and it's not so... <laughs> and we know it's not so easy, but um, we, we know that we don't meet often, but I think this is an important meeting, a very helpful meeting for you. Just as we, as we close up, is there anyone else... Uh, uh, is a burning question on your heart. You say, I really, I want to know this. I have this problem in class. It may be very specific or whatever. Anybody? If, if you want to ask or whatever, now's the time to. Uh, just about the choral reading. Yeah. If we have uh, younger kids, like elementary, is that applicable to them? What age? They don't know how to read. Yeah, that's early, what I'm early If they don't know how to read, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you'd just be telling stories yeah. Yeah. to them. Yeah. But make it very visual, show them pictures, you know, it, it's lots of songs, lots of pictures, lots of songs. You can show them essential words from that if they're learning to read, if they're at the end of this. So it might be like the character's name, it might be Moses, and you could, play. Then you could have a game at the end seeing who knew which one. But don't overwhelm them with words at that stage, but it's you really telling yeah, them the story. So yeah, that's like what, 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 P1, P2? P1, P2 yeah. You would be telling them stories. Yeah. 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 Is it helpful what we are doing is, is like the Bible memory verse? We ask them in a choral to read, and then later on, if we have time, one by one, we'll ask them to read. Okay. But then, and then until they will memorize it, or they say, oh, we will erase one, one word, yeah. 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 And that's showing them a strategy how yeah. to do it. Yeah. It's quite helpful anyway. There yeah. are many. Mm. Yeah. But if in our gonna, age, early if you're going to test to see whether they actually mm -hmm. know that memory verse, yeah. well, then I would right. do it the following week because you're just looking at short term memory there. I can do that quite well, but I can't remember tomorrow. And maybe not in front of everybody, yeah. do it quietly well, in the call. That's well, that's when you can do that. Like, well, that's, that's when you can do <laughs> like a temper pen and you can say, when you're ready, come and recite. Yeah. First one, yeah. first two, first whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's all that's okay, just two final things, and then we want to either turn you loose to food or to home, uh, because the, we know the time is the time is going on. Uh, 
practicalities within your classrooms, do we need to follow up on anything very quickly right now? Do you have the materials you need, the supplies you need? Are things working okay as they are set up right now? Uh, you know, we've instituted uh, new classes and new groups, uh, as, you, as you know. Um, if you'll recall, those of you with the class that has ocean and all those others with it, a lot of those kids are, are uh, generally not coming. There's generally a core group of the Nepali kids that are coming now. Uh, usually, usually Rohan, Kriti, uh, 